I'm Peggy Scott Laborde, and welcome to the Tennessee Williams and New Orleans Literary Festival's Conversation with John Patrick Shanley. And John, you have been with the festival over the years, but it's been a few years. So once again, we, we thank you for being with us. And just in case, you, and you, of course, um, viewers, you should know Mr. Shanley's work, but very quickly, I will say that, of course, he is a playwright, film director and screenwriter, winner of the Academy Award for Best Screenplay for Moonstruck. And we're gonna be talking a lot about Moonstruck in just a bit. Uh, the film version of Doubt was nominated for five Academy Awards, including Best Adapted Screenplay. He also directed it too. Very busy gentleman. Over 23 plays, uh, including Doubt, of course, for which he won both the Tony and Pulitzer Prizes too. Moonstruck was 1987. I know you were always working and so in a little bit, we'll also talk about what's next. But what I uh, have been really wanting to do for years is to talk to you about Moonstruck because this movie, and this wasn't a play, but it was originally called, it was, a, it was at a screenplay called The Bride and the Beast. Is that true? The Bride and the Wolf. The Bride and the Wolf. Okay, yes. that's all right. And as you may recall, Cher says at one point to Nick Cage, you're a wolf. Uh, and uh, I think also a, a, a liquor shop uh, couple, uh, she calls him a wolf as well. <laughs> yes, and of course the whole idea of the wolf and uh, the, the reason for him losing his hand and she thinking that it was a bad relationship to begin with, she's espousing this, and that he needed to get out of the trap. So the wolf uh, is, is there very many times. How, how were you asked to be involved with this? Did you come up with the screenplay and, and pitch it? Or what was the process? And this is 1987, of course. Uh, well, in uh, 1986, I was living in Washington Heights in a funky apartment uh, uh, with uh, unbelievable traffic noise outside and cracked windows and big holes in the wall. And I wrote Moonstruck. Uh, actually, the way that I came about writing it was peculiar. Uh, Sally Field called me up and said she'd like to have lunch. She admired my work. So I said, sure. Uh, and I went to lunch at the Russian Tea Room with Sally and her assistant. And uh, after we talked for a bit, I said, look, I'll write a movie for you, but you can't pay me. Uh, and if you like it, then we'll go into business. If you don't, then... I'll just go my way and don't worry about it. She said, great. So I wrote The Bride and the Wolf and I sent it to her uh, and she loved it, but nobody would make it with her uh, because film, which I was not used to because I was a theater guy, is very literal. And the film executives basically said, look, Sally, you're just not Italian. You know, we need, we need somebody more ethnic to do this part. Uh, and uh, so Sally was out, and then I, I sent it to Norman Jewison, and uh, he immediately optioned it. Uh, and uh, Larry Kazin read it at the same time, and he wanted to no, Norman step aside and let him direct it. And Norman wouldn't grabbed it all the more tightly for competing interests. And uh, we went into business, and we made the movie. <laughs> Well, uh, amazing. Now, just to set it up for those people who have not seen Moonstruck, we're talking about a woman, a widower, played by Cher, uh, whose name is Loretta Castorini, and this is a strong Italian family living in Brooklyn. Is that correct? In Brooklyn? That's correct. That's yeah. correct. She and was a widow. She was a she, widow, not a she's widow. She's a widow, yeah. And she is about to marry this gentleman who nobody around her really thinks is worthy of her. And apparently the gentleman has um, a, uh, a brother and a strange brother and she has been asked to make amends with the brother and, uh, and then the mom, her mom, who was went incredibly played by Olympia Dukakis is having problems with her marriage. And anyway, a lot of things ensue and that's a very, very quick, quick part of this. But the whole uh, part of the decision for share, um, there was a, uh, and you may have seen it a few months ago, there was a wonderful article in the New York Times about how Moonstruck has become this antidote to the pandemic. If you're looking for two hours <laughs> of something so pleasant and so pleasurable, it's Moonstruck. And Cher was interviewed and she talked about 
the use of her hands and how she, because she's technically not Italian, is she? No, I don't think she is. Uh, no, she's Armenian and, and I think to some degree Native American. Native American, and so actually taking hand lessons. But uh, as we know, in New Orleans, we have a large Italian, primarily Sicil Sicilian population, and of course in New York, a lot of folks use their hands. But she also said how much the cast enjoyed being with each other. And that's why, and that is clearly apparent on screen. Tell me about that, some of your recollections. Well, it was just one of those uh, happy chemistries where uh, the movie was impeccably cast with the help of Howard Feuer uh, and, uh, you know, John Mahoney uh, in sort of his first featured role was uh, this uh, English professor who dates girls too young for him, uh, who teaches at NYU. Uh, and Danny Aiello is the, the uh, fiance of Cher, who's not worthy of her. Uh, and Nick Cage is the firebrand brother, Ronnie Camareri, who lost his hand in a bread slicing machine and sports as a result a wooden hand. And he is worthy of her, but he came late to the party. Uh, and then, you know, we got Olympia Dukakis, who was also completely unknown in film. She'd done a play on Broadway called Social Security with Mike Nichols. Uh, and Norman saw the play and called me up and said, there's this woman, Olympia Dukakis. Uh, so they all got together and you know, it was a real mixture of kind of superstars uh, and complete unknowns, uh, like Julie Barbasso, who was a superb character actress but certainly not known. And John Mahoney was completely unknown. And Olympia Dukakis was unknown. And then you got Cher and you got Nick Cage. So uh, I think Cher and Nick really enjoyed uh, working uh, with a group of people who were just so happy to be there uh, on material that they took cotton to. Uh, and uh, although with the exception of Julie Bravasso, Julie Bravasso and, and uh, uh, Nick got into like an almost fist fight on the set because Julie could be quite difficult. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and I think she tried to give Nick Cage an acting lesson. Wasn't like, she a dialogue coach? Um, I think Cher refers yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, she did also, a lot. She was, I mean, she was a fabulous actress. I mean, after that, I cast her in a play and I had to fire her because she was just oh. really difficult, difficult. Oh. But uh, other than that one piece of uh, friction, uh, which that kind of thing can really help a show, uh, strangely enough, they all got on great. They were having the time of their lives because they were getting to do these sustained scenes, you know, where people really went at each other and had arias and uh, big moments and, you know, Nick like displaying his fake hand and screaming that he would never find happiness or love. And actors don't usually get to do much of that in film. Uh, and so they kind of had the time of their lives. Um, I Forgive me for quoting you, <laughs> but there are so many, uh, uh, great lines, in, of course, in this film. And I have quite a few friends who are always doing that. They're quoting lines from Moonstruck. Hence, I think one of the reasons why I, I've been wanting to get together with you for a long time. But one of my favorites, and I am Catholic, but it's going to confession. When it goes to confession, and, and it's very, it's made very clear, even, and if those who perhaps do not remember this or are not Catholic, you used to go to confession quite confidentially. You would actually go into the confessional and you would be behind the screen and the priest wouldn't see you and you conceivably wouldn't see the priest. Anyway, he would just hear you. Well, from the get-go, uh, you know, the priest says Loretta, okay? <laughs> he recognizes her voice. So she's obviously a regular, okay? But she, she starts to rattle off of her sins, you know, taking the name of the Lord in vain. And I slept with my fiance's brother. And then she says something else. And, then, and you never see the priest. You see his hands. He says, and I love this. The hand is like, wait a minute. Tell me about that second... <laughs> <laughs> that second sin. And then he gives her two rosaries. <laughs> Tell me about writing that. Uh, I mean, I, I, did you have a lot of experience in the confessional? 
Uh, well, certainly I did have a lot of experience in the <laughs> confessional. I was raised uh, in a small parish in the Bronx uh, and uh, uh, you were actually required to go to confession once a week back when you basically had very little to report. You know, you're like eight years old. Uh, uh, and, and you'd, you know, sometimes you'd have to sort of concoct a sin so that you didn't just go in and say you were a saint walking here on earth. Uh, the confessionals were interesting uh, environments because it was sort of like three telephone booths glued together. Uh, and uh, you would be in, uh, in one of the two telephone booths on either side and the priest would be taking the other person's confession opposite you. And you kind of hear a bits and pieces of what was going over there. And then he turned around and it was your turn. Uh, and uh, uh, the way that I came to write the scene was, well, we often try to slip in uh, uh, under the camouflage of casual tone. Uh, something that's more explosive. And that's what Sharon's character does in uh -huh. that scene. The, um, you know, he, when she realizes that she actually loves uh, Ronnie and she tells her mom for the first time and she says, oh, mom, I love him awful. And of course the mom says, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> you, know, it's, you, know, you know, with some of these great lines, is this something that you heard someone say? How inspired are you from just everyday life? Definitely the rhythms of the way that people talk, certain people in New York City, uh, profoundly inform the way that people in the film talk. There are very few direct quotes from things that I just overheard. There were more, you know, the way that I see things, but filtered through this very stylized way of talking that certain people naturally have uh, in New York, have certain rhythms. Uh, and I remember being on the A train and hearing two women talking and thought they could be in Lutz truck. You know, they had that exact thing going on. Uh -huh. Tell me about your fascination for the moon. I just rewatched Joe versus the volcano. <laughs> and at the end, there's a giant moon. And then of course, in, um, and it's New York geography, if you will, uh, in Moonstruck, Loretta parks her car next to the, I've actually been there a long time ago, Luna Ristorante, which is technically a Mulberry Street. It's not in Broadway. The moon is coming up. Tell me about you and the moon. Well, you know, I was a kid in the Bronx uh, and at night, uh, you know, and the Bronx is not as built up as Manhattan. Uh, so the night sky, and also this was Earlier, this was, you know, like in 1960 when I was 10 years old, the night sky was much more dramatic because there wasn't as many lights on the ground. Uh, and when the moon came out, it was kind of an incredible event. And it, you know, which something that I learned later uh, when I was trying to understand this powerful emotion that I had connected to the moon was that the moon was a busted off piece of the earth that had if you want, tried to escape, uh, but had been trapped in orbit around us ever since uh, in a kind of unrequited relationship where it can neither leave nor fully come home. Uh, and I guess I feel that way about being born in life itself, that you can't quite get where you want to go and you can't leave either until you do leave. <laughs> Love it. And, and of course, I mean, we, once again, we could go on and on, but you know, what's on the radio, Claire de Lune, <laughs> you know, and so that must have been so much fun, those little, little pieces, those little hints putting that together too. Oh, absolutely. And you know, every, you know, when she goes to the beauty shop, it's the Cinderella beauty shop. Uh, everything has, uh, uh, you know, sweetheart liquor store, is, uh, she goes to buy uh, a, a split of champagne. Uh, it's it's everywhere in the film. You know, uh, it was fun to also watch those moments, the uh, sort of moments of celebration. And yes, her preferred uh, beverage is is um, champagne. But um, was this an, an Italian tradition of putting the sugar cube into the champagne? Where did you get it's that? A, was, it's called the champagne cocktail. Uh, and uh, there, uh, at one point. Uh, in New York, there was a, a restaurant, I think it was called Madame Romaine's, 
where they only served omelets and the menu was like 200 omelets to choose from, you know? And their uh, featured beverage was champagne cocktail, which is a glass of champagne with a, a sugar cube dropped in it and a dash of Angostura bitters. Uh, and so I, tr I, when I had, I had an omelet there one day and I noticed that when you put the sugar cube in, the incredible activity that takes place in the champagne glass. And I thought that that was a very photogenic drink with a certain romantic tinge. Uh, and so when I put the uh, script together, that was the, the, the drink that was done in sort of ritual moments uh, in Loretta Castorini's household. And then after we did the movie, I heard from all these Italian Americans, oh, how did you know? You know, I had no idea. <laughs> well, you might we be- in my house. <laughs> well, we might be learning something here in New Orleans because the champagne cocktail, and in this instance in New Orleans with Peixos bitters, which is a cousin to Angostura, okay? Yes. That's actually a pretty popular drink. So maybe it's the Italian side of New Orleans or Sicilian side coming to it. But I I, when I saw that in the movie, and it's funny because I've seen the movie so many times, but I noticed that I happen to like the bubbly. But it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> sugar cube, sugar cube. It was very exciting, uh, very exciting. Um, Question, when you are, when uh, in this particular instance, were you on the set of a movie? Yeah, I was on the set as needed. As you know, needed. I showed up for the, certainly the first day of principal photography, which was in New York, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, quickly realized that Norman wanted to establish, uh, if you have a question, look at me and only me uh, as the director. Uh, and so I took off and then uh, he would call me uh, like they were shooting in Brooklyn uh, and say, look, we, we have a little problem with this one scene. Can you come out? Uh, and I would go out and was actually, I remember it was a bitter cold night uh, and uh, Nick Cage had a problem with one line that he had in this scene. And I think Norman wanted it in and, and Nick didn't. Uh, and so they call me in as the tiebreaker. We were in a trailer and rehearsing it and everything else. And uh, Nick said, you know, I don't want to say it. I said, well, on the line, you're right. But in terms of the philosophy, what's trying to be expressed in this scene? And he said, stop right there. Philosophy, philosophy. Okay, look, I'll just say it. I'll just say it. <laughs> you remember what the line was? <laughs> uh, it was about uh, milk and cookies, uh, you know, I, it, it, but it was in the big speech. It was in the big uh -huh. speech. And actually, I can't remember whether it ended up in the film or not, the line that we were talking about. I don't, uh, I don't uh, really, <laughs> I don't really know. But we would have those occasional, you know, I was up in uh, Toronto when they were shooting the Grand Chichino scene. And uh, Norman said that I want to be in the scene as one of the people in the restaurant. And I, I, I said, where would I be? And he pointed to one of these tables and a, a seat at the table. And I said, well, how long would I have to sit there? He said, probably, you know, eight, 10 hours. I'm like, forget it. <laughs> good move. Wanna, I don't want to be <laughs> in the movie. <laughs> yeah, good move, good move. Uh, back to some favorite lines, you know, Rose Castorini and as it turns out, John Mahoney have ended up having a lovely night together and he would potentially like to make a little whoopee, okay? And he walks her um, home and unfortunately she sees her father-in-law, which adds to a little bit of, uh, of a challenge there. Uh, but he, he says, oh, aren't you gonna invite me in? And she says, mm -hmm. I can't invite you in because I know who I am. Please speak to that. Mm. Well, isn't that just the truth of things? You know, uh, either you're coming from some place particular, either you are somebody or you're not. And what I mean by that is everybody is somebody. Some people know it. Some people know what they think and what they feel. Uh, and they have their code. They have their way of going about their business. Uh, and uh, those people are, have an extra special level of protection. And I'd say magic, because there's nothing more magical than being yourself. Mm, yes. Vincent Gardinia, of course, as the patriarch, uh, I, you know, he doesn't look like he moves a muscle. And you know, eventually there is a little bit of a smile. What was he like to, to, to spend time with? Vinny was a great guy. And, you know, Vinny lived in Brooklyn. 
Uh, and when I we we, be, we were friendly, and when I I, I, I called him, uh, he answered the phone and he said hello, who is it? And I said hey Vinny, and he said Vinny's not here. Who's calling? And I said John Shanley. He goes hey John, how you doing? <laughs> he made no effort to disguise his voice or anything. He just was not willing to admit he was him until uh -huh. he knew who he was talking to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we went out a few times. He was doing a play with Larry Storch uh, uh, about gangsters, uh, a, a, a comedy, and uh, I think him and Philip Bosco. Uh, and we went out afterwards, and uh, I said something about that Larry Storch needed to cheat out more because, you know, so it's like he would look right at Vinny and you wouldn't see his face and you wouldn't hear what he was saying. And Vinny was like, I tell him every night. <laughs> <laughs> cheat out, cheat out. <laughs> so he was just kind of a great guy. And I was, I was uh, 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 very sad when he passed away. He was a great actor. Danny Aiello, as it turns out, um, you know, worked with in this film and he's, he's so wonderful. And then a few years later in January, man, and yes. so did you, you know, was he, of course, Norman Jewison, the, the distinction being that he directed both of these films. Uh, was he somebody that you got to know? Oh yeah, no, I, I, I hung out with Danny many times. Uh, and uh, he was, a, he was, <laughs> he was very funny. Uh, and sometimes unintentionally so. He did not know, uh, and by the way, Norman Jewison produced the January Man. He didn't direct it. A, oh, guy, named Pat, uh -huh. a guy named Pat O'Connor directed that. Right. But uh, I do believe that Danny didn't know that Moonstruck was a comedy. <laughs> and when he saw the movie, he was mortified that he was uh, being reacted to as a foolish character rather than like a macho character. Uh, and I, he, 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 and for that reason, he didn't really like the movie for a couple of years until he got over that and realized mm -hmm. that he was getting so much good back from Moonstruck that he was starting to like the, the movie. <laughs> but he, he did a play in New York and I remember him telling me, it was House of Blue Leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, John, I don't know what I'm doing. I, what do I know about being on stage? So my preparation, somebody said, what's your preparation? I said, my preparation is I stand in the wings and right before I go on, I say, help me God. And then I run on stage. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's not Divine intervention, Lodsky, please. <laughs> but it's kind of working for him. <laughs> So what is it like, you know, to be out up there winning the Academy Award for Moonstruck? Tell me about your Hollywood days. Well, um, it's a great thing. It's, it's one of the uh, real uh, unexpected pleasures of doing what I do. Uh, winning an award is just fun uh, if you can get into it. Uh, and I did. In, uh, I was fortunate in that. A lot of people go up there and you have to spend, in show business, you have to spend your whole life defending yourself, you know, against terrible disappointment, which is what you have to experience most of the time, things like that. And when I walked up on stage and I turned and I, you know, I got kissed by Audrey Hepburn and oh. hugged by Gregory Peck, handed the <laughs> statue, and I turned around and there was every famous person I'd ever seen. Uh, and I thought, a voice came into my head, and I've always been grateful for it. It said, let this in, let this good thing in. Mm. And I put down my sword and shield and I let it in. Uh, and so I experienced the happiness of the momentary acceptance that a, a war provides. And then you go back to real life. <laughs> What a, a great thought though, let this in. Uh, yeah, it's almost like this whole capacity for happiness is becoming, it seems like it's becoming increasingly rare, especially in these days, but let this in. Now, what about the Tony, your first Tony? Your to Tell me about the Tony. Uh, well, when I won the Tony for Dowd, uh, I was really cranky because uh, 
they just wouldn't let me eat. Uh, you know, we did the, uh, the whole show uh, and then there was press before the show, uh, the Tony Awards and after the show. And then when we got to the place where, you know, there was the party, they took me to a separate room where I then had to do a, a lot more interviews. And it was just sort of like, when do I eat? And that moment sort of didn't come until, I don't know, like midnight or something. Uh, so it was strange. I, I definitely, I, I was not, I did not experience that moment of pure happiness that I experienced with the Oscar. But maybe it was also because by then I knew too much, you know? Uh, but I, I very much enjoyed, I very, in retrospect, especially, I enjoyed uh, winning the Tony. I probably enjoyed winning the Pulitzer more because uh, the Pulitzer, which, why would you know this? They have a lunch and the president of Columbia uh, calls your name and you go up and he shakes your hand and says, congratulations. And that's it. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do any press. Uh, and uh, it's just a really nice thing. Uh, and so that was fun. I enjoyed the Pulitzer. Let's talk and we'll move on to doubt. Now, you know, here you are in two in the different capacities. You know, not only have you written the play, the screenplay, and you're directing. I mean, is that your ultimate setup, that your preferred setup that you can control at all, pretty much? I'm not really into control. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, uh, uh, I don't mean a that's a bad thing. <laughs> okay. But uh, well, no, no, no. Yeah. You know, look, a lot of directors are really into control, uh, and uh, a lot of other people as well. And some of them flourish with that. But for me to control something is to watch it die in your hands. Uh, so, uh, I sort of try to take what, like, what, what comes, uh, and, uh, I, you know, when I did, uh, Joe versus the volcano. I wrote the screenplay because I felt like it. Uh, and I sent it, I said to my agent, send it to Steven Spielberg. I think he'll like this. Uh, and I didn't know it. I was just like an obscure playwright in New York. And I, then I got a phone call. Hello, is this John Chelia? Hi, this is Steven Spielberg. I'm like, oh, 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 nice to meet you. Uh, and he said, I read your script. I think it's great. I understand you want to direct it which I had never said to anybody, nor particularly thought, and said, uh, yeah. And he said, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> and well, that's, how I became, that's how I became a movie director. <laughs> and of course, the first movie I'm directing has typhoons and uh, invented foreign cultures. And, oh my God. Uh, so uh, that and was- Abe Pagoda and Nathan Lane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing people that I got to, Ossie Davis and Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I did Doubt, I did the play and I got a call from Scott Rudin, who uh, I was one of the producers and who I knew. Uh, and uh, he asked me to come into his office. I came in and he said, I think this should be a film. And I said, yeah, me too. And he said, I think you should direct them. I said, okay. So that's how I became a movie director again, because I hadn't directed a movie in 17 years after the first one. Uh, and then uh, I just directed a movie, Wild Mountain Time, uh, with uh, Emily Blunt and Jamie Dornan and uh, Chris Walken. Uh, and uh, again, a friend of mine who produced a lot of my plays called me up and said, I just saw your play. I think it should be a movie and that you should direct it. And I said, okay. And so, I, you know, that ended up in Ireland in a rainstorm shooting uh, another film. So, and on it goes. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, back to doubt. And once again, I, I will very, uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind setting it up very briefly so we can move forward in case folks haven't seen it. What, what is the Well, uh, doubt is uh, set in a church school in the Bronx that uh, basically I went to. Uh, and it's about uh, a principal, a nun, Sister of Charity, uh, and uh, one of her teachers, who's also a Sister of Charity, played by Amy Adams, uh, and Meryl Streep played the, played the principal, Sister Aloysius. And Sister Aloysius suspects the uh, young, charismatic priest in the parish 
played by uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, of uh, abusing a child sexually. Uh, and uh, she sets on, off on a mission to bring him down. She has no concrete proof, but she has her suspicions and she has circumstantial proof. Uh, and uh, the story is about how she does finally succeed in bringing him down and the aftermath, the emotional cost of that. Um, in the midst of her campaign, if you will, to do this, um, she walks outside. It's a very, very windy day and there are branches uh, that, that are, come down in the yard. Uh, and she's talking to the, jan I guess the janitor who uh, says, boy, and, 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 uh, and we should also point out, we're talking about Irish and Italian immigrants that would have been going to the school at the time. This is 1964, I believe, isn't it? The early yeah. 60s, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the, uh, the janitor says, this is like the, the worst win since uh, um, it, uh, outside, uh, since I, I was in Mullingar. And I wondered about that because of course, later on <laughs> you have a play, which is of course uh, the crux of your, your movie. Absolutely, which we'll you absolutely. Where just that Tell just me about off that. camera, just off camera is the other story. Always, you know, in Ireland, there was a, a, a legendary great wind that went through Ireland and knocked down, you know, enormous number of trees and barns and things. And uh, it had legendary status. And when I was there in earlier days, before I made a movie there, uh, I asked people about the Great Wind and they all remembered it happening at a different time. Every single one of them, it happened in their life. And then I found out it was supposed to have happened like in the late 1800s or something. And none of these people could have been alive. Uh, but uh, I just thought, you know, when I had lunch with Meryl Streep, about doing the film of doubt. Uh, uh, I, I said, I want to add a character to the film. Uh, the character is the wind. Uh, and she said, oh, I love the wind. And right then I thought, oh, she's planning to do this movie. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, of course, uh, so there, so much know, there. The so incredible wait. other thing in the story of doubt both on stage and on film uh, is uh, the character Mrs. Muller who is the black mother of the only black student in the school and the one that the principal uh, suspects the priest of having abused. Uh, and the scene that they have uh, uh, is all of 10 minutes long. And on stage it won Adrian Lennox, uh, the Tony uh, and uh, on film it really introduced in a big way Viola Davis mm -hmm. to a national audience and she was nominated for an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's so stupendous. And of course the whole um, uh, yin and yang of, of, of uh, Amy Adams and, uh, and, and Meryl Streep's characters because one is very, very strict. The other one is kindness and then the priest is, is a priest who is trying to be your friend. And um, in, a, in an interview that I was watching with you recently, you talk about the cult of personality, how, and maybe this is almost like, you know, anticipating Vatican II where things are opening up, perhaps they are more friendly and Sister Aloysius is not that way. Everything is strict. The way she walks around, um, Sister James is, is class. She's in the middle of trying to teach a history lesson. And here's the disciplinarian. Speak to that, if you will, that, that big difference in the personality. Well, I mean, you know, the, uh, the Second Vatican Council was underway at that time. Uh, and, uh, the, and so there were these cross currents in the schools of uh, some of the clergy thinking this was the greatest thing that ever happened and others that thought it was the end of civilization. Uh, and uh, these nuns were in charge of our education the most part, but they were overseen mm -hmm. by the priests. They did not have ultimate power. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the church scandals in general, heaven knows that uh, the vast majority of these cases that have come to light were, it was the priests that were abusing the kids. Uh, and uh, what I thought about was one of these nuns must have known uh, and, and fought back. That's what sort of brought the idea to the 
forefront of my storytelling imagination was that nun, and I knew those nuns, and they were strict and they were terrifying, and some of them were kind. Uh, and uh, I'm like, this is a very sort of battle of the titans kind of thing, because they each have their domain. Uh, and uh, they're going to go at each other, and I wonder who would win. Uh, I didn't have to know at the start of the telling of the story. Well, in incredibly and sadly, this particular uh, theme is resonating more than ever before um, in New Orleans. And it's a huge problem with the archdiocese, which is in, in effect has had to declare bankruptcy okay, over it, but also is trying to grapple with, you know, a meeting with the, um, the victims of abuse and trying to deal uh, with it. But it is an enormous problem right now in the city. So watching this is like, oh my goodness, you know, sa sadly, uh, it, it really, really does resonate. The way you set up the first few uh, minutes in the movie, we're, we're at mass, okay. And I, 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 like, I hadn't thought about this in so long, the wearing of, for women, the mantilla or the chapel veil. Everybody had their chapel veil on, yep. you know. And of course, you know, the altar boys and the bells. And there's something about, I guess, to a baby boomer Catholic, the, 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 the sound of those bells really resonate. Were you ever um, a, 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 um, an altar boy or? I, I was an altar boy. I was thrown off of the altar boys for drinking altar wine. Oh, which is certainly a point <laughs> of a, it's a story a, point, a in the film. point in this in the plot, of course, too. Wow. Um, you said you lived in Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. Mother Cabrini, uh, Cabrini High School, and sadly, I think it's finally it, it just closed. But I went to Cabrini High School in New Orleans. So I, oh, sure. I know Mother Cabrini when I went to the chapel and I saw Mother Cabrini lying in the chapel up in Washington Heights. That neighborhood. You know, it's one of the strangest that, that Mother Cabrini supposedly never decomposed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was it Her, was really something to see her, you know, yeah. laying out there under the chapel. I, I mean, the altar, rather. I was I was pretty stunned uh, by that. Yeah. Well, uh, my understanding is that for a long time, that was what, a middle to lower middle class neighborhood. And now it, it is perhaps even more ethnic. But now I understand that it's a very shishi neighborhood. Things have changed, huh? Uh, well, we're, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Manhattan real estate exploded and that is part of Manhattan. Uh, when I was there, I was paying $750 a month for a two bedroom apartment. Uh, uh, and it was, but the elevator was broken. Uh, the, half the mailboxes were broken open. Uh, it was, it was very different. I'm sure they put some money into it since. <laughs> There's a lot of murders at that time. There were a lot of murders. And oh. It's cleaned up. There was a lot of, lot of uh, drug dealing coming out oh, of that neighborhood. That's sad. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the feathers, if you will. I mean, that is a, 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 such a quintessential scene. Uh, would you set that up for us? I mean, that is the most amazing. I, I mean, I'm still thinking about that. Now, I've seen the movie quite a few times. The, the, the meaning and the use of feathers in, in um, that. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the priest played by Philip Seymour Hoffman gives a sermon uh, about uh, a woman who uh, gossips about somebody and then goes to confession uh, and asks whether that's a sin or not. And uh, the priest says, yeah, it's a sin. And uh, what I want you to do is I want you to take a pillow from your bed and take it up on the roof with a knife and cut the, the pillow open and throw the contents off the roof and come back here and tell me and tell me that you picked up all the feathers. And so uh, she comes back and she said, I did what you told me uh, and cut open the pillow and spread the feathers out. But I, I, when I tried to pick them up, it was impossible. They were everywhere. Uh, and he said, and that's gossip. That's gossip. Mm. And that's actually a very ancient sermon, as far as we know, given for the first time by the cure of ours in the Middle Ages. Mm. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't know that when I wrote the play. Uh, I heard it in my parish and the priest gave it as if it were his own. So uh, he was a plagiarist. 
<laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, well, maybe that's a venial sin. <laughs> he didn't say that he'd written it, so I guess it's all right. I guess it's all right. And, you know, of course, uh, the scene where she confronts him, you know, for the first time in his, her office, there's, uh, that just had, well, I'm sure it was very hard, you know, but I mean, as a director, it is a director's dream, uh, the business that you put into that, where, you know, should he be sitting behind the desk? You know, and he goes and he sits behind her desk. We're talking about the pecking order, as you said, you know, yes. that the priests are supposed at the top and you go through this protocol in terms of all that. But he sits there, the tea, it's a very tense moment when poor uh, Sister James, played by Amy Adams, you know, is, uh, you know, is trying to serve him tea and she's practically shaking. But all of a sudden the light bulb goes out overhead. Tell, what's that about? Well, uh, it's building uh, tension or? Well, it's not simply building tension because in another scene, she's replacing the light bulb uh, when the uh, when Viola Davis comes to see her, and she's also listening to a transistor radio with the earpiece, uh, and so she doesn't hear the knock at the door, uh, and all of that kind of specific business, I put in to give a motivation for the camera to move, for the actor to move. Uh, because you can't just have a person sitting at a desk and another person sitting in a chair uh, in an extended scene. The audience will simply stop listening to what's going on in the scene. So you have to uh, constantly find a, a good grounded reason for that actor to move. So I have intercoms buzzing, phones ringing, uh, sunlight coming through uh, blinds that, that somebody's got to close the blind. Somebody else got to opens the blinds. Uh, uh, motivated movement uh, to make the scene stay visually active. And watching and kind of rewatching that scene too. Well, the phone rings. That's adding the tension because she won't answer the phone. And then some of your camera angles are very askew. So of mm -hmm. course the audience is feeling the tension as well. Yeah. It's emotional, you know, the camera is, is you, the audience. How would you see it? Uh, and what would you look at? Uh, and so uh, sometimes we see things in distorted ways because we're very emotional. Mm -hmm. Wow, uh, just such a powerful film. And Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, just what a loss, <laughs> you know, just, yeah, yeah. And, and the way yeah. his, his hair is closely cropped. I mean, we remember priests, from those days, you know, just the look of him, he, he really is tr was trying to em, em, embody. Um, did he, um, I know that many actors in the films try to stay in character. Was he somebody like that or? Uh, it, no, it wasn't so much that he tried to stay in character, but he spent a lot of time uh, in, a, in a room by himself, the door open, but in a room by himself, looking pretty miserable. And that was concentration. He was concentrating. He was working on the role. We were friends. I, I had known him for some years. We went on vacation together. Uh, oh. And I said, if, you know, Phil, if I were an actor, if I looked as miserable as you, I would do something else. I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I didn't understand fully what he was going through. Acting was saving his life. Uh, it wasn't make, it wasn't the thing that was making him miserable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and do people come up to you, especially right after then and, and with the play and say, so did he do it or didn't he oh, do it? Of course, constantly, constantly. Yeah. And of course, at the end, Sister Aloysius, I have my doubts. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, I remember uh, for so many years, and I guess this is all pre, of course, pre-Vatican too. But a lot of the nuns were named after men, after saints. Yes. My first grade school teacher was named Sister James, uh, uh, and uh, and so I named uh, the character of the young nun Sister James in her honor. And then when we were in previews with the play, uh, I got a call from somebody, and they said. Sister James heard you wrote a play and that she's in it, she's excited and she's coming tonight. And I was like, I thought she was dead. <laughs> I was like terrified. Uh, and uh, I wondered if she was litigious. Uh, and uh, 
sure enough, that night, we were off, doing, off Broadway at that time, uh, she showed up with another nun, and both of them had taught the two sections of first grade in the year that I went there when I was six years old. And they were still incredibly vibrant and still teaching. Uh, and uh, I was absolutely certain they were dead, absolutely certain. So then we sat down, uh, she and I side by side and the lights came up on the scene in the play and we had gone up to that parish and we'd gone up to that church and we had recreated parts of it on the stage. And so she and I suddenly found ourselves looking through the magic window of the theater is into the past and it came, as it came back to life again in front of us. I get chills just thinking about it now. Uh, who gets to have that experience with this woman who was the person who taught me to read and write? Mm. When you are you know, setting up uh, the world, especially the world of the nuns and the, and the priests, which, and it's so powerful, of course, the nuns uh, dying, you know, with nothing said. There's no conversation, no, because of Sister Alois, just is so tyrannical, uh, you know. And getting up in the morning, it's the routine, and the younger nun is helping the older nun, and and then and then <laughs> you go over to the dinners the priests are having, and they're drinking the wine, and they're having a good time. That contrast, and, and, I mean, just the whole idea back to Sister James, you know, of the sacrifices that were made in, you know, yes, Father, yes, Father. And today we were like, no way. But yeah. those were the times, weren't they? They were, you know, the convent and the rectory uh, uh, were separated by about 25 feet. Uh, and uh, in the convent, they were under a vow of silence and could only speak when the Mother Superior rang a bell, which she only did a couple of times a week. Uh, and in the, and they, you know, a friend of mine's mother had been a housekeeper for uh, one of these setups. So, so you know, they would, uh, she, she would bring foodstuffs to both the convent and the rectory. And this guy's mother was scandalized because the food quality for the priests was so much better than for the nuns. Mm. And so she would steal the priest's food, some of the good cuts of meat and stuff, and bring it over to the nuns because she felt so bad for them. Uh, they lived very different lives. The priests smoked all the time if they wanted to and did, drank whiskey, ate very nicely. And the nuns lived in a world of silence and abstination. When Sister Aloysius finds out that indeed this priest that she has gotten rid of has moved on up to bigger and better things. And that's what happened. That. That's what happened a lot is the church would move people around when there were complaints about a priest, they move them somewhere else and very often he'd get a promotion. We have certainly felt that down here, those stories. And there are some amazing journalists who are tracking the priests and have spent a lot of time doing it. And just how many times a priest was moved yeah. and still ministering and even some sadly deacons, uh, deacons as well. So enjoyed <laughs> your brand new movie, Wild Mountain Time. And of course, based on the play Outside Mullingar, uh, what an A-list of actors uh, did you, you directed. So did you cast them? Did you say, hey, I want you to be in this? How did that oh, come sure. Uh, you know, yeah, the director has everything to do with who's cast in the film. Yeah. A director in film has a lot to do with everything. So, uh, you know, from the design, to the locations shows and the whole thing. And um, when I did the play, it was called Outside Mullingar, as you mentioned. And I said ever afterwards, I said, that's probably the worst title I've ever come up with for anything. It's really travel directions as opposed to a title for a play. And when we did the film, I said, well, I'm gonna want to be in a part of Ireland where there are some mountains because my own uh, internal terrain is more hilly 
than uh, the Midlands where my family's farm in fact is. I said, I want you to find me the most beautiful farm in Ireland and the most beautiful mountain. And they found both in the same place in a town called Cross Molina in County Mayo. Uh, and it was just a fairy tale spot to shoot a film. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the farmer and the farmer's wife uh, were, uh, the Connors were just the loveliest people. She, the, the, the farmer's wife was like a movie star. I was like, you're a farmer's wife? Uh, she has a, we, have, we put her in the, in the movie in a scene where she's sitting at a picnic table next to Jamie Dornan. And you really want to look at her more than him. And he's a pretty good looking guy. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and also I wanted to feature this song, Wild Mountain Time, which is a favorite of mine. Uh, and uh, uh, that I was like, well, if I'm going to have that song, I need to have a mountain. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> I think you do. Um, now that is quite an interesting casting decision because of course, Jane Dorn is, is known better for Fifty Shades of Grey and talk about antithesis to this particular character who's kind of shy and doesn't realize that Emily Blunt <laughs> really cares about him. And then John Hamm comes on the scene. I mean, it was pretty spectacular. Was, um, was it fun to shoot or I mean, did, did you have to occur weather issues or? Well, I mean, you know, it's County Mayo where, you know, west of Ireland, it rains a lot. Uh, and we were there at the good time of year, so we had a lot of splendid weather. But we, heaven knows we had our share of rain. Uh, and uh, it was fun to shoot because the actors were having an incredibly good time. Uh, and so it's always fun to shoot happy people. Yeah, and Christopher Walken is clearly having so much fun chewing up the scenery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he is definitely uh, uh, ha having a good time too. Now, um, the whole effort of mounting that, did you, uh, did you want there to be a film version of that play? Or did somebody, have you been pitching that? Or did somebody come to you and say, what do you think? No, uh, the uh, a producer that I worked with a lot in theater years ago, Leslie Erdang, uh, who had become a film producer, uh, she went and saw the play and called me and said, I think this should be a film. And I said, me too, because whenever you're doing a story that takes place in Ireland, you want to, you know, you don't want to be just in New York, like we, we did it on Broadway and it was great, but you're in New York making believe you're in Ireland. Right. How much better is it to actually be in Ireland and be shooting that glorious scenery and all of the livestock and the incredible sky and uh, the ambiance of the place is just uh, incredibly resonant. So uh, it was uh, a no brainer to go ahead and make a film of the play. How wonderful, and especially in these times, to do a feel good movie, because that's a feel good movie. Okay, yeah. you know, where they call rom coms that term. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I came away, I watched the movie a few times and I came away feeling very, very good about it. And of course, the ultimate feel good movie, according to the New York Times, uh, Moonstruck. But you are not adverse to doing some pretty, um, uh, let's shall we say, uh, dark uh, films as well. Um, Alive about the Andes survivors. How did that, uh, in, you know, unfortunately having to revert to cannibalism, how did that come on your plate? No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> I was say. Um, well, I had done Joseph, Joe versus the Volcano with three producers, Steven Spielberg, Kathy Kennedy, and Frank Marshall. Well, pretty Kathy illustrious. Uh, okay. Yeah, Kathy Kennedy and Frank Marshall were married. Uh, and uh, a while after that, they went off on their own, started their own company, Kennedy Marshall Company. And uh, they wanted to make a book of the, uh, they wanted to make a movie of the book Alive, which I had read when I was in the Marine Corps uh, and really enjoyed. And uh, they came to me and said, you know, uh, what do you think? You want to you try your hand at this? And I, I recommended somebody else uh, for, the, for the job. And they went to, to him and he said, I don't want to do it because like a, 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 a woman gets her, her leg, she gets a cut on her leg. 
And they came back to me and said, well, you want to do it because a woman gets a cut on her leg. And I said, well, that's a ridiculous reason not to do I said, I'll do it. And so uh, then I, I, I jumped in. It had, I, I did it on one condition. I don't have to read any of the other screenplays because it had been in development for 17 years. Oh. And they had a stack of screenplays two feet high. Uh, and I said, let me just go right to the book and take it from there. And I did. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and fortunately, Jeffrey Katzenberg uh, called me up after I turned in the screenplay and said, I'm so relieved because we're like in pre-production and we didn't have a movie and now we do. And then I met and hung out with uh, several of the survivors, mm. uh, uh, Nando and uh, Roberto, Roberto Canessa, uh, the two guys who had uh, climbed in their loafers out of the Andes and saved the whole group, mm -hmm. uh, uh, came to New York and I spent time with them, especially Roberto and his wife. Uh, and uh, they were magnificent people. So, you know, even though this terrible ordeal had befallen them, they were very young men and spent 70 days above the tree line uh, in the Andes trying to survive. They mm. tried to rescue them. They couldn't find them. They finally gave up. And so where they were, there wasn't even a blade of grass. Mm. Uh, and uh, they lasted for almost two and a half months and still found the strength and the determination to hike out, which was a massive feat uh, of the Andes and, and finally contact uh, another human who, you know, got on the phone and, and rescue operation was underway. So it was a, it was a, a very inspiring uh, experience really because these guys not only survived, they became substantial and beautiful people and continue to thrive, a lot of them, to this very day. Very inspiring. Um, what is next for you? I was reading about the Twinkle Brothers. Uh, yeah. uh, tell me about the Twinkle Brothers. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I just, I wrote a movie called The Twinkle Brothers, uh, <laughs> which is about uh, two guys uh, from Puerto Rico, brothers who, and one of them, all he wants to do, and you know, he's like a dog, all he wants is for his brother to love and accept him. And his brother doesn't want any part. And so they, one, the brother who doesn't want anything to do with the other brother, he moves to New York. And so of course the brother who's desperate for his love, he moves to New York. Uh, and he, in his own way of trying to ingratiate himself with his brother. He wants to do everything that the brother wants to do. And the brother doesn't want him anywhere around him. He doesn't want him to do anything. That he, mm -hmm. And so they end up finally opening com competing restaurants across the street from each other. Uh, and uh, then they get involved in different efforts to out success, uh, find, be more successful than the restaurant across the street. And madness ensues involving lighting that they start to, each one starts to put more and more lights up over their restaurant and that hence the title the twinkle brothers uh and ah, okay. uh, it culminates around a christmas battle to the death uh of lighting uh and that's that's kind of the so you're in the writing stages or you've already written it i've, I've written it I've okay written it. So next, so moving forward to the making of the film. We'll start with like making a, doing a, a, some offers to actors, see where we get to. All right, very good. Uh, before we, we leave you, um, Tennessee Williams, <laughs> your favorite Tennessee Williams play. Uh, that's, that's impossible to answer because the, you know, it's sort of like the solar system, you know, like, do you love Saturn more than Pluto? Uh, it's, uh, it's this spectacular range of Williams' work that is one of the most uh, ongoing, inspiring things about his playwriting career. Um, I mean, I, 
I certainly love the Rose Tattoo uh, and Sweet Bird of Youth and the obvious, you know, Streetcar and the Glass Menagerie, which is, I, the last time I saw the Glass Menagerie, afterwards I said, I'm not sure I can see that play again. And my friend said, why? I said, I said, because literally every line is famous. Every line of the play is famous. I mean, who ever even heard of such a thing? But, uh, and deservedly so. Um, he's, uh, you know, celebrating, uh, among other things, uh, certainly New Orleans and the Sicilian culture uh, that uh, uh, settled near New Orleans, around New Orleans. Uh, and, but in a, in a time when there, were, when there were such vibrant cultures. I mean, one of the reasons that I'm so fond of New Orleans is because they still have a culture. Uh, I'm not sure how they managed it, but there's really kind of no place else like it. And no one has ever successfully turned it into Disneyland. It is still New Orleans. Uh, and uh, when, when, you know, playwrights, we, we thrive on specificity. Like what makes this place different than that place? And with the mass media, uh, you know, what television did to the homogenization of the culture, what malls and big box stores have done to uh, the uh, uh, sameness that's all around us, the importance of being specifically somebody and having a specific way of talking and looking at things is ever more precious. Uh, and one of the things that Williams did was he created a living gallery of characters that will endure forever and keep alive things that otherwise would have been swept away. Uh, and so it can't be overestimated what he did for world culture by capturing in these incredibly sparkling, expansive spheres, uh, these uh, uh, groups of people, these ways of speaking, these ways of thinking, uh, I adore him. Thank you. Well, as a committed Orleanian, <laughs> born here, raised here, I love to hear that <laughs> about yeah. the city. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Uh, it's been it's such a delight just to get to visit and uh, hopefully we will we'll see each other in person sometime in the future at a future Tennessee Williams Festival. And just a reminder uh, for more information about the Tennessee Williams Festival, go to TennesseeWilliams.net. Thanks again, John. Thank you.